Welcome to the August installment of our summer 2022 webinar series sponsored by NIST. Today's presentation is Ensemble SLRs for Forensic Evidence Comparison. Your speaker today is Dr. Danica Oman. Danica earned a bachelor's degree in mathematics, a master's degree in mathematics with a statistics emphasis, and a PhD in computational science and statistics, all from South Dakota State University. She joins us today as an accomplished assistant professor in the Department of Statistics at Iowa State University, and she's a primary investigator and research lead here at CSAFE. Danica, take it away. All right, thanks. And I'm gonna tell you today, I'm like Anthony said about ensemble SLRs for forensic evidence comparison. Um, I'd like to start by saying that this project has been um, the result of a lot of hard work from my graduate students. So thank you to Fetty for all of his hard work. I would also like to thank CSAFE. Um, this project is part of a statistical foundations project that I lead here with CSAFE, but it also has a lot of overlap um, with the handwriting project that we've been working on. So you'll hear a little bit about both of those projects today. Um, so thanks to CSAFE and NIST for the funding and for inviting me to do the webinar. So briefly, I want to touch on the type of problem that we're going to be addressing with some of the things that we've been working on in this project. So we are going to be addressing what's called the common source problem in forensics. Um, and so this is something like, I'll talk more specifically about handwriting, but this is something that applies across multiple domains um, in forensics. And so, for example, if you are looking at a case of glass evidence, um, maybe you have a series of break-ins. There are two different crime scenes. Um, you know, people broke in. Uh, maybe you collect a couple of people and you say, okay, can I figure out whether um, this person I think is related to the first crime scene and this person I think is related to maybe the second crime scene or the same crime scene? Um, which is it, right? Do they come from the same crime scene or were these two people associated with two different robberies? So can I tell if the glass fragments come from the same window, putting them at the same crime scene? Um, in the case of handwriting evidence, this common source problem arises when you're trying to compare two question documents and see if they come from the same writer. So for example, if somebody has a stalker and maybe they're receiving these threatening notes. Um, can we tell if the person who's sending or writing these threatening notes is the same person? Hopefully this poor person does not have two stalkers, but maybe we can link them to, to one individual. This is a little bit different from what I've been calling the specific source problem. So this is dealing with two different types of evidence and seeing if they come from the same source. This is not trying to link that evidence to the particular person of interest. We're just trying to link two um, crimes together or two different pieces of evidence together without saying that it comes from one specific individual um, that could be your suspect, so. That's the problem that we're going to be focusing on. Um, and so the way that you can think about this sort of pictorially, if you want, is to assess these two different propositions. So you have these two different items. Like I said, maybe they happen to be these threatening notes. Um, and we'll call these items of evidence EX and EY. And you may, for example, think about this first proposition, which is called, or what we call the prosecution proposition. We call that HP. And the prosecution proposition basically says that these two items come from the same source. So there is one source depicted here by this circle, and it has generated both items of evidence. Again, maybe these are these two question documents that were written by the same person. Um, the defense prosecution or the defense proposition might say that these two items of evidence do not come from the same source, but from two different sources. So here we have these two different sources denoted by these two different circles, and each one gives an item of evidence separately. So this is the type of problem that we're trying to approach um, for this seminar today. Can we tell if two things come from the same source or from two different sources? 
So in order to help answer this question of can we tell if these items come from the same source or different sources, we need to actually look at the items and compare them. So one way that we take a look at these items is to obtain these measurements on the items, um, look at some distinctive features. And so these measurements, we're just going to denote UX. Um, so the information you get from the first one and the information you get from the second item. And you would want to look for maybe similarities or differences between the measurements between these two items. And like I said, I'll talk a lot about handwriting today, but um, this could be applied to many different types of evidence that we deal with here in CSAFE and elsewhere. So for example, if you're thinking about that glass problem, if you're trying to tell if the fragments of glass on these suspects has come from the same crime scene, um, you might, for example, look at the trace elemental profile of these glass fragments and see if they look similar enough to say that they come from the, the window at the crime scene. Um, or if you're looking at bullets, you might, for example, look at the land engraved areas and you might extract some signatures of all the striations across this land engraved area and see whether or not the striations look similar enough to say that the bullets were fired from the same gun. Um, if we're looking at something like digital evidence, if you're looking at um, determining whether a camera um, has taken two different pictures, um, you might be looking at comparing, for example, the noise residuals of those images to each other um, to try to get at what's called the camera fingerprint or um, the camera PRNU. And then what we're going to focus more on for the rest of the webinar today is on handwriting. So um, I'm going to talk in a little bit more detail here how we segment the writing into these different features um, that we call graphs and how we do some stuff with those to say whether or not two documents have been written by the same writer. So a little bit more about how we handle extracting measurements or features from handwriting here at CSAFE. Um, the traditional approach is for a forensic document examiner to visually look at two different items, so two different question documents, and identify these distinctive features or traits. So they may be looking at all sorts of different distinguishing features, like, you know, the loops on your Y's or your G's, or how tall is the stick on your T's or D's? How high does the crossings go? All these things that document examiners are trained to look at. Um, in Safe, Safe, we try to um, not necessarily mimic that approach, but we try to come up with similar ways of looking at writing by looking at the shapes of the writing and comparing them. So in order to do that, we have sort of a long process that I'll try to describe briefly here. So it starts out by taking a scanned image of writing, like you may see with this blue C-safe writing here. And the first thing we do is we binarize that image. So basically we take out the color and we turn it into black and white. Um, once we have it turned into black and white, then we skeletonize the image, meaning we take the thickness of this writing um, and we make it a one pixel wide skeleton that sort of is supposed to go through the middle of this thick writing. Um, and then once we have that skeleton, which you can see here denoted by this very thin black line, then we're going to take that skeletonized writing and chop it up into different segments. So we're going to chop it where these red um, dots are, and we're going to break it apart. And so sometimes you can see that we break it where a letter would break between letters would occur. Um, sometimes not. it's not dependent on um, what letter is actually seen there. It just breaks it up according to some algorithmic rules. Once we have these things broken up, so for example, let's look at this segment that's split by these two dots here. Then we take that segment of writing and we turn it into a graph 
where the nodes are beginning and ending points. And again, they're denoted by these red dots here or crossings um, where two lines connect. And then the edges are the writing between the nodes. So that would be the skeleton that connects each node um, to all the other nodes. Once we have these graphs that represent the segments of writing, then what we would like to do, similar to what a document examiner would do, is look for other segments of writing that look similar to that one. And we're going to group those together. So we're going to take all of these graphs that we see in a set of documents and try to cluster them together into seg um, segments or graphs that look similar. So for example, we might put things that look sort of like, you know, Fs or Gs, something with two loopies in this particular cluster. You can see this cluster loops things together that are sort of just sticks straight up and down. So maybe like I's and L's, things that look similar in that way. Um, and then, you know, you can see that you would have these other clusters of things that look similar. And so essentially what you see in this cluster is you see all the black stuff is all of the segments or graphs that got grouped together. And the red is sort of like an average of what that cluster would look like. And so the idea is for each individual writer, we would have all these groups of graphs for their documents. And our hope is that the um, graphs could then be used to help us distinguish between different writers. So essentially what I'm showing here is one way that we can sort of visualize what these cluster frequencies look like to help us characterize different writers. And so the different colors here are three different writers from a data set that we've collected at CSAFE. And you can see that for this particular set of data, we've grouped the graphs or the segments into 40 different clusters. So along the axis here, you can see the 40 different clusters, however they may look, but they're groupings of similar writing structures. And you can see how many of those types of structures um, occur in documents from these three different writers. So you can see, for example, these clusters right here have very different proportions for each writer. Um, particularly, this green writer is pretty different from the blue or the red writer. And so some of these have you know, very obvious differences. Um, some of these clusters have maybe only very subtle differences. But the idea is that you should be able to see enough differences across all 40 clusters to tell one writer from another writer based on the way that their letters get shaped into graphs. So once we have these sort of, the sort of template of how a writer looks according to these measurements that we've extracted and quantified, um, then we would look at comparing those um, across different pairs of documents to see if they looked similar enough to say that they were written by the same writer or different enough to say that they were written by different writers. So in this case, we happen to know which ones were written by same writers and different writer pairs. And what this first panel of this plot is showing is in the red, it's showing all of the differences between pairs that we know are matches. So we know they come from the same writer. And so you can see that their differences, these red lines are a lot smaller than the ones that we see in the blue. The blue ones are the ones that we know come from different writers, the ones that do not match. And so we can see that we would see bigger differences, again, for the ones that come from different sources than the ones that we see coming from the same source. Another way to visualize this is to just look at taking sort of a vectorized difference between these um, and then, you know, boiling it down to sort of this one number distance between all of these cluster proportions. And that's what's shown in this graph here. 
So again, we can see that for these matches, the red ones, their differences seem to be a lot smaller than these blue ones, um, or these blue ones we know to come from non-matches from different writers. So we can see that there is some pretty good separation that we see here between the red and the blue, which helps us say that we can tell whether two documents were written by same writer or different writer. So how can we quantify that type of answer to this question. So if we're trying to decide between these two different propositions, same writer or different writer, um, can we say with a quantitative number, how much more likely is it to be same writer versus different writer? Um, and the way that we do that is by computing the probative value. So experts in the field would recommend that the best way to do this um, is to use a likelihood ratio framework. Um, so this likelihood ratio framework is, you know, strongly supported by statistics. It gives you a quantitative value. There's a way to communicate uncertainty associated with it. Um, so this is the way that's recommended because it basically allows you to say, what's the likelihood of observing this type of evidence given the prosecution proposition? versus what's the likelihood of observing this evidence given the defense. So it allows you to compare those two propositions um, directly by taking the ratio of their likelihoods. So this is one thing that um, we are striving for, but that means that we have to find a likelihood or a statistical model for the features. And sometimes that's easy to do, and sometimes that is not easy to do. So in the case where determining a statistical model for your features is not super easy, like this complex type of handwriting evidence, you may decide to um, look at what's called the score-based likelihood ratio instead. So rather than looking at the a likelihood function for the evidence itself. Um, one way that we can do this is to look at those comparisons that I showed in the previous slides with those plots and say, you know, mimic what an examiner does, compare the two different items of evidence and come up with some idea of what the similarities and differences are and put that into a single score. And this single score here we're gonna call delta. So delta is a numeric value that says what's the similarities and differences that I observe between these two different documents in this case. And then we're going to come up with a statistical model, this function G, to say how likely would it be to see this type of comparison score given the prosecution model versus how likely would it be to see this particular comparison score given the defense model? And we're gonna just take the ratio of those two things. Um, so in a lot of cases, we need to then focus on this G, which may be an estimated probability density function um, in order to actually compute a value for this SLR. So, Again, um, essentially what we are doing with the SLR is finding um, the probability of observing the score under the two competing propositions or models for how we've decided to say what the evidence looks like, where now we're looking at a comparison score that is univariate. So if you have a score-based likelihood ratio um, system, then this allows us to say how much does the evidence support numerically um, one hypothesis over the other. So if your SLR is greater than one, then the evidence or information that you've seen supports the prosecution proposition with a magnitude corresponding to the value of the SLR. 
And if your SLR is less than one, then the information or data you've seen in, with your evidence supports the defense proposition, um, where the magnitude, again, is related to how big or how small the SLR is. So one way to think about, um, basically you take this value of one, which basically says there's equal support for the prosecution and the defense uh, and use that as a cutoff point and say, if you have a situation where you know the ground truth and you know it happens to be a known match and you see that the SLR is less than one. So in this particular case, you would call that misleading evidence because it's pointing in the wrong direction. The same thing happens over here in this red area where you would know that you have a non-match or different sources, but your SLR is greater than one. So it's supporting the prosecution when we know the defense is true. So again, we would say this is misleading. So these two areas indicate um, misleading evidence in the red here. Another way that you can think about this is saying, okay, well, let's choose to have, rather than a hard cut off at one, let's choose to have some area in the middle where we say, um, maybe we don't have a strong conclusion towards support for one proposition over the other. So let's choose a cutoff point, let's say at 100. And if we know that we have a known match and our SLR is larger than that cutoff at 100, then that means we would have sort of strong evidence towards the prosecution. So this would be strongly discriminating evidence for that um, proposition towards HP. Uh, conversely, if you take a cutoff of one over a hundred and you say, I have a situation where I know these things come from different sources or they are no non-matches and my SLR is pointing that way strongly or it's less than that one over a hundred cutoff point, then that would be sort of strong evidence towards the defense. So you would have strongly discriminating evidence in that particular case as well. So these two things would tell you in the green whether you have um, good discriminating power with this um, SLR. Now, there are other ways to cut up this, basically say what the SLR means by looking at its magnitude. Um, so you could split it up instead of these three categories we've shown here. Um, maybe you would have a finer scale that has something like nine categories like they do with handwriting, for example, um, or 10 categories or 11 categories like they have in the European scale. Um, but anyway, this is what we mean when we say that we have misleading evidence or we have good discriminatory power. So in order to develop an SLR system, um, we need to have a good comparison metric to compute the score. And we need to have a good method of estimating those densities G under both propos propositions. <laughs> so we need both of those things in order to have a good SLR. Now, some of the ways that people want to do these comparison metrics and these density estimations, for example, um, machine learning methods, kernel density estimation, they rely on the assumption of having independent samples. And in the case where we are doing comparisons, um, these pairwise forensic comparisons, we do not have that independence. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, how that might be the case that this independence assumption is not met for forensic comparisons and why that's an issue for creating a good comparison metric and estimating the densities. So let's go back to this handwriting problem. In the case of handwriting for common source, we have these two question documents and we have their measurements and we're trying to say, um, are they written by the same writer or are they written by two different writers? And we need to come up with the scores and we need to come up um, with the densities in order to get this SLR. 
So often in order to estimate these densities and come up with the scores, it's assumed that you have some data set that you can work with. So this data set we often call the background population or the alternative source population. And in the case of handwriting, you would want to have several documents from several different writers um, that you can work with. And then what you would like to do is generally you look at all possible comparisons between the documents within this background population. Some of those you know will come from the same writers, so we call, call them known matches. Some of those we know come from different writers, so we call those known non-matches. Um, and when you do this process of doing all these pairwise comparisons, we get some same source pairs and a lot of different source pairs. So in fact, there is quite an imbalance between the number of same source pairs we have and the number of different source pairs. So if you just look at a simple set of background population data where there are 10 sources and five repetitions from within each source, then you would have 100 same source pairs to work with. But you would have um, over 10 times that amount of different source pairs. There would be over a thousand different source pairs. So there is a huge imbalance between different source and same source pairs, which often causes an issue um, for some of the machine learning or classification algorithms to get the scores. This isn't too difficult to overcome this issue. Normally we just downsample the larger set to have it be of a closer to equal size. So you would basically take these a thousand plus different source pairs and subset them down to just about a hundred so that you had about a hundred same source pairs and about a hundred different source pairs. But that's not totally the issue. So while that does cause an issue, um, there's another problem. The other problem here is that you have multiple items that have been used multiple times. So if you look at just the source level when you're creating these pairwise comparisons, there will be known match comparisons that are repeated, there are the same sources in several different known match comparisons. And the same source will also be in several different known non-match comparisons. So the items that contain the same source should be more similar. So there's some dependence upon them. Um, also at the item level, multiple items are used in several different comparisons. So you compare this one item to all the other items um, and you do that for every possible item. So there's this complex dependency structure that can be kind of um, visualized by looking at this picture. So you can see here um, some items from different sources that are colored and numbered. So this would be two items from writer 10. Here would be, you know, um, here's a five and a five. So here would be two items from writer five. And if you were to compare those between these two with the same writer, they would be known matches. And if you were to compare between say like item or source five and source one, they would be a different source comparison. So you can see in this first plot, there are very many, many more known match pink lines than there are green lines. So that's the imbalance problem. To, so to account for that, we can just get rid of some of the pink lines so that there are the same number of pink lines and gray lines. And that's what's shown in this middle picture here. But you can still see that there are um, several lines coming out of this item 10. And also these other items 10 have several lines coming out of them, connecting them to other lines. So essentially, in order to get rid of the dependence, we only want to have one line coming out of each one of these nodes so that we can get rid of that dependence. And that's what's shown in this last picture here. This is something where we no longer have imbalance. There's the same number of same source and different source comparisons. And multiple items and sources have not been used more than once. 
um, this is a good thing in that we get rid of those two problems. This may be a bad thing in that you can see we've thrown away a lot of our information. We've gotten rid of a lot of our comparisons. So I'll come back to this in just a minute as to how we can make that more efficient. Okay, so one way that we have decided to solve this issue is to use this strong source sampling algorithm that accounts for both of these problems, imbalance and dependence in the data. Just an overview of how this works. You start by constructing all those pairwise comparisons, and then you're basically going about the process of removing those lines or connections in that graph so that each node only has one line coming out of it. And that's what this is basically saying. We remove the pair that's already been used from possible use as a comparison in the future for both known matching pairs and known non-matching pairs until we can't come up with any more comparisons. And then that data set will have accounted for the imbalance problem and for the dependency problem. Um, so this is what we call our strong source sampling algorithm. And we're going to use this in multiple layers of our algorithm to deal with this issue. Um, another way that we have gone about solving this issue um, of having dependence in our data and as a way to sort of gain some of that efficiency back by throwing away too many comparisons is this idea of generating multiple experts that we um, have borrowed from the machine learning literature. So in this particular case, rather than having human experts, our experts are going to be score-based likelihood ratios. So we are going to generate multiple score-based likelihood ratios um, and then do some stuff with them. But the idea is, is that each base expert or each base SLR will use the strong source sampling algorithm so that each of our experts will get a data set that doesn't have the imbalance problem and that doesn't have the dependence problem. And then we're going to train a machine learning comparison score based on this data set now where all the assumptions to actually use the machine learning algorithm have been met. Um, we're going to also use this algorithm or the strong source sampling idea to fix the fact that we need to have dependence when we're estimating, or we need to have independence when we're estimating the densities. So we basically create a whole bunch of base SLRs to serve as our experts where each base SLR, base SLR has seen um, an independent data set um, where we are making full use of all possible comparisons, but not the ones that are dependent when we give it to each SLR. Once we have all these base experts, we need to aggregate their opinions into one final score. So before we aggregate their opinions, we've also taken this idea um, for machine learning as to optimizing. So in the idea or in the spirit of some experts may be better trained or more trusted than other experts, we may have SLRs that have come out of this system that may perform better in some regards than other SLRs, and we may want to weight their opinions or their values more heavily. So the way that we do this is to use a separate optimization step to optimize some aspect of the SLR's behavior first before we ensemble or aggregate the expert opinions. So essentially an ensemble is just a way to take all these multiple experts and put their opinions together into one opinion, or in this case, one value of the SLR. So we're going to compute all these individual base SLRs and put them together into one final SLR, sometimes with that optimization step and sometimes without it. 
So this is sort of the general flow of what we see. Um, we start out with all these background measurements. You know, these are the ones that don't contain your evidence. This is that background population that you have to work with. We use the strong source sampling algorithm to get sets of data that have independence and are balanced. Um, and we have to get three different sets, one to train the um, machine learning algorithm to get your comparison metrics, so one to get the delta, we use one set to estimate the density, so one to get the G, and when we use it, we use another set to optimize the performance of our experts when we aggregate their conclusions, so we get these weights um, and combine them with the base SLRs to get this final ensemble or ESLR. So in order to test this approach of ensembling, um, we have used two open source data sets of handwriting. We've used CSAFE London letters as that background set um, to train all of our base SLRs. And then we've used the computer vision lab data set um, for validation. We've decided to use a random forest based comparison metric. Um, and we've decided to use um, a logit or a logistic transform to do the density ratio estimation. So essentially the way that this thing works um, is we've done a sort of large simulation study to test that this algorithm, this ensemble approach is working the way that we would hope it to work. So we've done 500 repeated experiments of generating these ensemble SLR systems where each ensemble is constructed from 50 base SLRs and then the corresponding weights according to the workflow. We've also created just a traditional SLR that does not use ensembling. Um, that just splits the background population and down samples to obtain um, sort of a baseline comparison point. And then using that CDL data set, we've generated some um, out of set validation where we have 1,000 known matches and 1,000 known non matches to test out this system. And we've um, basically compared our ensemble SLRs to the traditional SLRs um, in one of our experiments. And then in our other experiment, we looked at basically the idea of getting consensus. So if several different experts look at the same exact comparison, would they agree or would they reach some level of consensus? Um, and that's the same idea that we did here. We looked at whether our base SLRs or our experts, um, what level of agreement or consensus did they come to for our second experiment? So we looked at sort of a couple of naive methods of doing that. One naive method is this traditional SLR. Um, and then we have looked at three different ways of ensembling. So one way of ensembling is just to take the mean value of all of the base SLRs and combine those to get your final value. Instead of taking the mean, you could also take the median. Um, or you could just take a majority vote. So you can basically separate out um, the magnitudes of your base SLRs into categories and pick the category that had the most number of base SLRs or experts in that category. So these are all, you know, either a non-ensemble method or ensemble methods that have not been optimized. So that's why we call them naive. Um, but we have also tested several different possibilities for optimizing our ESLRs. Um, one way is by looking at the log likelihood ratio cost function. Um, so this should take into account several different, um, several different types of measurements that you see down here. For example, like the rates of misleading evidence. Um, we also had one where we just optimized for rates of misleading evidence for known matches. We had one where we optimized for rates of misleading evidence for known non-matches. We had one where we optimized discriminatory power just for known matches or just for known non-matches, or one where we have done a combination of all of these things. 
um, and also one where we did sort of a weighted voting scheme. So these two are sort of weighted things um, and also this CLLR are sort of weighted things um, of all of these types of measures and then sort of each one of these measures individually. And so what we would like to see is that the performance of these ESLR methods would be better than the traditional method that ignores the fact that there is dependence in the data. So based off of the experiments that we've run, these 500 different experiments, um, we've looked at these different performance characteristics. So this is looking at the rates of misleading evidence um, in for the known matches and for the known non-matches. So those were those red values in the table. So is your SLR pointing in the wrong direction? And we obviously want the rates of misleading evidence to be low. So we would want to see box plots on the lower end of both of these things. So we can see that all of the ensemble methods here in the red and the blue are showing lower rates of misleading evidence for known matches at the cost of a slight increase in the rates of misleading evidence for the known non-matches. So we are seeing better performance in this particular case for the ESLRs than we are seeing in this one. Um, but if you look at the scales, there's a much, we get much more payoff here and we're giving up very little over here. Um, in terms of the discriminating power, we are seeing that um, you want your discriminating power to be large. So you can see that we are getting some pretty good increases in discriminating power for all of the ensemble methods compared to the traditional SLR method. So the traditional SLR method um, is not discriminating well, so it's not creating that strong evidence effect. In fact, that you generally, for the traditional SLR, tend to see values um, much closer to one so that you don't have support for one hypothesis over the other. Um, and we can see that happens for both known non-matches and the known matches that our ensemble methods are performing better in this regard. Um, in terms of consensus, you can see that some of these have better consensus um, than others. So you would want to see sort of, if you had kind of a robust system, you would see lots of consensus, like you see for the naive methods and for some of the ensemble methods. Um, but some of the optimized ensemble methods we'd see um, not as good of consensus as we would see for other types. So just to kind of wrap things up, our results have shown that our ensemble SLRs can perform better than traditional SLRs because those traditional SLRs produce inconclusive results a lot. Um, and so we have been able to increase the discriminatory power and particularly reduce the high rates of misleading evidence for the known matches at the cost of slightly increasing the misleading evidence for known non-matches. Um, we have also seen in previous work that our traditional SLRs are more sensitive to changes in the training and estimation sets. Um, and our naive approaches perform a lot better. So they're a little bit more robust methods to changes in those data sets. Um, so overall, we've introduced this sampling algorithm that remediates any of the dependency um, issues that we have by doing these pairwise forensic comparisons. Um, and for this testing set that we've used um, and looking at popular methods um, that require independence, well, now we can do that because we have these sampling algorithms to um, get rid of the dependence that's there. Um, and introduce sort of pseudo independence or complete independence. Um, as an ensemble learning, we take this approach of taking multiple experts um, and giving them just a partial view of the data, aggregating their views together to getting one final conclusion that looks at sort of all of the data um, and combines multiple experts' views into one final value 
of an ensemble SR. So thanks everybody for listening at this time. It looks like we do have a couple of questions, I think, in the Q and A. Um, so let me try to switch over here and address some of these questions. Okay, so um, the first question asks whether or not there are correlations between the clusters. Um, so let's see if I can go back here. Um, so I believe the question um, is about these, these clusters of um, writing segments that we get for the handwriting. Um, and at this particular time, we have not actually quantified how much correlation, if any, there are between the clusters, but I do expect there to be correlations between um, the different clusters so that you are essentially giving your machine learning algorithm potentially correlated features. The second question says, are the samples from two subjects who are both trained in handwriting by the same instructor more similar than those from two random individuals? Um, in our particular data set, we do collect from the writers the location of where they got their third grade education, but we do not know if they, you know, shared the same penmanship um, instructor or teacher. So um, there's, there is no way to, from our data set to answer that question. Um, at this particular time also, we have not looked at having skilled handwriting forgeries in the mix. At this particular time, we are assuming that all of the writing we have um, is in a person's free and natural writing. So at this time, we are not dealing with forged handwriting. Danica, I wanna thank you for presenting today and for, uh, for sharing this approach with us. Thank you all for joining us. And we hope you have a great day.